pray together. God, you are beyond the universe. You hold all of it in the palm of your hand. You existed before there were measurements of time. You have always been. You always will be. You are stable and solitary and self-sufficient and self-existent. All else depends upon you. And we depend upon you. We need you. We confess to you this morning our need of you. We confess to you this morning our need of your word. We ask to be recalibrated, to think rightly about the world around us, to think rightly about ourselves. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would use your word in our hearts this morning to accomplish your work. We ask for this help for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I would like to express for a moment gratitude on all of our behalf to Chris Drent and uh, the musicians who lead us so faithfully every week. Uh, they, are, they are something like the, the play button on a CD player or maybe the needle on vinyl. They get us started singing to the Lord giving us an opportunity for all of us, the worship team, to express to God what is in our hearts. And I hope you find yourself on Sunday mornings as we gather that the beginnings of expressing as we read lyrics on a wall and join our hearts to melodies and harmonies and instrumentation so skillfully done that what comes into view is a, an adoration of God. It is what we're here to be all about. And I just have the privilege of, of knowing Chris behind the scenes and, and watching his labors and watching the labors of the instrumentalists who come on Wednesday nights and rehearse and come early on Sunday mornings and rehearse and the invisible guys in the sound booth who we never know they exist until there's a glitch or something. They never get the credit. They get all the blame. Just part of the job. And they serve us so faithfully so that we can gather without much thought ahead of time and have our hearts riveted by the glories of God in song. Uh, I just, I want to boast just a little bit in uh, the future of that ministry. In student ministries, uh, Chris has been teaching, instructing uh, a younger set of musicians in the theology of worship the life theology of, of an entire life lived as a sacrificial altar, a sacrificial sacrifice on the altar of service to God and giving expression to that on pianos and guitars and whatever else you have in there, kazoos and stuff. And really training another generation of people to do the same things we benefit from every week. So um, encourage the musicians when you have opportunity um, and and just be grateful to the worship team, which is the church gathered together to worship God, who is the audience. Thank you, Chris, for leading us in that way. The regular flavor of Grace Bible Church on Sunday mornings as we open the word together is expository preaching. If you've been around a while, you, you understand that the content and the topics of, of what we look at together on a Sunday morning is merely the text of scripture. If we're preaching well, we're not preaching the ideas of men, uh, the, the thoughts that somebody might think might be important for a group of people to hear, but what God's word says. Expository preaching is the putting out from the text the meaning of the text of scripture so that we can understand it and have it driven home in application to our lives. Consecutive expository preaching means next week we pick up where we left off. Next verse, what's there? And you might come Sunday mornings, maybe you read ahead. It's, it's nice to know what's coming. You can actually read ahead if you want to. Maybe you come Sunday morning and I don't know what we're going to get into. For my part, I'm surprised every week. 
I, I go into my study and I get to mine the riches of God's word and and I make discoveries every week. It's like being an archaeologist and finding new treasures. And, and they are to sink deep into my own heart and course through my veins before they come out here. But consecutive exposition is something of a, a joint uh, discovery of the truths of God's word. What are we going to find next week? I don't know. I haven't studied it yet. <laughs> and we get to hear it together and, and be a part of it. Some of the difficulty with consecutive exposition, and, and I'm not blaming God's word for this. I'm, I'm blaming my own heart for this a little bit. It, in a book like Revelation, we come to another scene of judgment. Didn't we do that last week and the week before and the week before? Now we're looking at seven more bowls of judgment. Didn't we have seven trumpets and seven seals before that? Haven't we gotten the point? I need to repent and believe the gospel and let go of the world a little bit more. It's all going to burn. And I, just a heads up this morning, the application is the same. I'm not going to get creative. <laughs> I'll begin very simply this morning by simply reading the text that is next. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation 16. And our plan is to cover the first 12 verses of this chapter. Then I heard a loud voice from the sanctuary saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image. And the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood, like the blood of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you, who is and who was, O Holy One, because you judged these things. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to the sun to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the authority over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. In 49 BC, Julius Caesar, who was a local Roman provincial governor, decided that he wanted to start a civil war, unite the Roman Empire, create a Roman Empire under him as dictator for life. That was his desire. According to Roman law, it was illegal to enter the Roman precinct with arms. No general could enter with his sword. No army could come in. And the northern boundary of that precinct of Rome was the river Rubicon. When Julius Caesar set out on his quest to unite and dominate for life all of the Roman provinces... He knew that if he crossed the Rubicon, this was a capital offense. It was illegal. He and all of his generals could be summarily arrested and executed. And Suetonius, in his recording of this event, says that Julius Caesar, on the banks of the river Rubicon, said, the die is cast. And so to cross the Rubicon meant to go past the point of no return. There was no going back to the Greek ideas of government. We would now have an empire and an emperor. We would have a Caesar. We would have a dictator for life. 
It's a bold move and one you would hope you would win if you were Julius Caesar, because if you didn't, you were dead meat. To cross the Rubicon is to go past the point of no return. And that really is the scene in our text this morning, except we're not talking about some Roman provincial governor seeking to build for himself an empire. We are talking about the world in its calamitous, haywire pursuit of rebellion against God, crossing a point of no return in its rebellion. And it is eternally lethal for the world. By way of outline, this is pretty simple. John just gives us the outline. We're going to cover the first six bowls of judgment. And so that's the outline, six bowls. Six bowls of God's climactic judgment of the world. Look at verse one. Then I heard the loud voice from the sanctuary saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And we learned at the beginning of chapter 15 that these are the last judgments. These are the last plagues because in them, the wrath of God in this age against a rebellious world is finished. So these are climactic. This is the apex of human rebellion. This is the apex of God's judgment against the earth dwellers. Of course, by this time in world history, the church will have been removed. There will be no restrainer, no one holding back the sin of a rebellious world. Everybody is going to live up to their fullest potential of their individual and collective depravity. The great missionary enterprise will be done. The great commission is over. And of course, during the tribulation, there was a remnant of Jews and Gentiles who will have believed the gospel and then will have proclaimed the gospel. In fact, the days of the tribulation will be cut short to preserve the lives of those who belong to him intended to survive. Two witnesses will have been on the earth proclaiming God's truth. The 144,000 Jewish males, 12,000 from each tribe, the evangelist spread across the earth will have preached the gospel. And an angel in the sky would have published the saving gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that for the most part does not listen. And when the final series of judgments is dumped out on the earth, the world will be in its climactic final state of rebellion. The world's inhabitants who have not believed the gospel will have taken the mark of the beast. They will be irretrievably lost. The world will have gone past the point of no return. Notice in verse 1, it is a great voice out of the temple, out of the sanctuary. And back at the end of chapter 15, we learned that God was alone there. Remember, the the temple filled with smoke and God had to be alone. No angel, no living creature, no uh, glorified saint could be in his presence until this wrath is done. Give him room. And so this is God's voice that comes out of the temple. And the command is loud and clear. Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. God's voice is described as great here, and the word great shows up in more concentrated fashion in this chapter than in any other chapter in the Bible. Eleven times the word great is used, and I think it's a tip of the hat to the reality that this is, in fact, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the culmination of his judgment. These bowls, again, are large, shallow dishes, and they are filled to the brim, filled to overflowing with the wrath of God, and they are to be dumped out on the earth in rapid fire succession against the earth dwellers, one after the other, without breaks, bringing to an end the great tribulation. This happens in the last half of the tribulation, during the three and a half period when Antichrist has a kingdom and is on the earth. This will be the last three and a half years of our present era of world history. And it accelerates towards the end. And just like the plagues poured out on Egypt during the Exodus, these will be in succession one after another. But these plagues will not be localized. They will be global. They will encompass the planet and everyone on it. These last plagues. Bowl number one, the first plague found in verse two is terrible sores. Look down at your Bibles. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who have the mark of the beast and who worship 
his image. Uh, the word for sore here is where we get our, get our English word ulcer. It is an open wound. It is called here bad and evil, uh, translated uh, loathsome and malignant. These are incurable, painful boils erupting on the skin. Just like the sixth plague in Egypt in Exodus 9. Moses in Deuteronomy 28 gives a commentary on that. And the commentary reflecting back on the sixth plague on Egypt is a warning to Israel. Follow Yahweh and believe him. Because you saw the plagues done on Egypt. These kinds of things will happen to you if you do not love him. Deuteronomy 28, 15. It shall come about if you do not obey Yahweh your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I charge you today that these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Yahweh will smite you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and the scab and the itch from which you cannot be healed. <laughs> Yahweh will smite you with madness and with blindness and with bewilderment of heart. Yahweh will strike you on the knees and legs with sore boils from which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. That description in Deuteronomy gives us a, a picture by parallel of the kinds of wounds that are described here in this plague in Revelation. It, of course, will not be limited to Egyptians or Israelites, but to all who have taken the mark of the beast. Notice this is a discriminating judgment in verse 2. These boils will not appear on believers. And like many of the plagues during the exodus from Egypt, uh, they impacted the Egyptians, but left God's people alone. That will be true in this case. And the specific rebellion of taking the mark of the beast during the tribulation, uh, taking on one's hand or forehead the image or the number of Antichrist, to, to place his mark on a human who is designed by God to be an image bearer of God. Humanity was designed by God to have his imprint, his mark, as a reflection of who he is as sub-regents on the earth, lords of the earth. Humanity in his rebellion ever since Genesis 3 has rejected that stewardship, that responsibility, and has marred that image bearing. And in humanity's final rebellion... Humanity will trade image bearing for God for very explicit image bearing of anti God. Satan's man, Antichrist, the beast. This is a very particular rebellion that draws from God a particular anger. God will put a mark of judgment on those who took the mark of rebellion. This was a rebellion past the point of the return. You take the mark of the beast and your eternity is in the lake of fire. All that remains for them now is a, a life on earth of unrepentant blasphemy, painful misery, and death. And in this last iteration, marked by God with the incurable wounds erupting on the skin. And all of that followed by eternal judgment and eternal misery. Consider our culture today, obsessed with the vitality of youth, the recovery of youth, with beauty, youthful vanity, uh, an emphasis on external beauty. And during this plague, every rebel on the earth will be physically revolting. The sights and the smells of open wounds all over everyone will do away with all of that vanity. It's as if the inner corruption of the wickedness of the human heart is erupting outward on the human body for all to see. The open, festering physical wounds reveal the grotesque reality of the human heart in its natural state, enslaved to sin, no longer restrained by a, a working human government or, or the presence of the church or the restraining work of the Holy Spirit. Fully absorbed in self-worship and demon worship and Satan worship. Twisted in rebellion against its maker. The sickness on the inside is making its way to the outside for all to see. Humanity will have gone past the point of no return. 
Bowl number two, contaminated oceans. Look at verse three. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. The sea here is a reference to the large saltwater bodies, the the oceans that cover 70% of, of the earth's surface. In Exodus 7, God turned water in Egypt to blood. Here this happens on a much grander scale. All of the oceans will become basins of congealed blood. The description here is the the kind of blood that is thick and dark and putrid and goopy. The blood of a corpse. The world's oceans have been the very basis of the food chain. Home to most of the world's life. The ocean basins are the storehouse of our planet's water, which everything needs. The hydrological cycle of our atmosphere picks up water by evaporation, brings it over to the continents and rains fresh water, desalinates it for us, and then fills our land with water for crops and for drinking and for everything we need for life. All of that will be ruined 50% of our oxygen comes from the ocean, specifically from the phytoplankton in the ocean. When every living thing in the sea dies, 50% of the oxygen supply is gone with it. And add to that all the scorched earth policies from God that have eradicated many green things over and over and over. The life-giving oceans will become giant basins of death. Blood in the body is a carrier of life, but out in the open, even the sight of blood is the marker of death. And the text tells us every living thing in the sea died. This is a mass extinction event. Astronomers are worried about some rock colliding with the earth. Or maybe 12 billion years from now, the sun gets a little too big or a little too small. Alien invasions nuclear holocaust, the world comes up with many different scenarios, but the Bible has made it clear that God will be in charge of this mass extinction event as a judgment against rebellious humanity. The biome for most of the world's life becomes a mass grave. And our planet, that brilliant blue marble beautifully poised against the black backdrop of God's universe, will become the red marble, polluted, ruined in a reeking stench of congealed blood and death. In 1989, the Exxon Valdez ran aground in South Central Alaska. 10 million gallons of crude oil were spilled. 1,300 miles of coastline were ruined. Tens of thousands of seabirds washed up dead. Untold numbers of other kinds of marine life were killed. Billions of dollars were spent and years were exhausted trying to clean it up. It's a drop in the bucket. That is a small spill and an easy cleanup. When the world's oceans become coagulated blood, there will be no recovery. There will be no ecological bounce back. Nothing survives. This marks the end of the oceans and everything in them. Bowl three, contaminated rivers. Look down at verse four. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. This is an environmentalist nightmare. This is an economic catastrophe, and this becomes ostensibly an extinction event for humanity. Just as the Nile River and all the tributaries and springs in Egypt in Exodus 7 were turned to blood. And Psalm 78 comments on it this way. God turned their rivers to blood and their streams, and they could not drink. How long can you go without water? How long can the world go without a water supply? Now, all the fresh water sources on the whole planet are done. No water to drink, no water to clean with, no water to cool. And you can imagine how terrible it would be to not be able to jump into a cool pool under bowl four. Arizonans almost understand that plague. Look down at verse five. 
the angel of the waters said, righteous are you who is and who was O holy one, because you judged these things. We have here the angel of the waters. We, we haven't seen that anywhere else in the Bible. And, and here we get this designation that there is an angel whose realm of authority, care, protection, and supervision is the waters on our planet. This is the angel whose responsibility is the bodies of water on earth. And he is declaring the justice of God in the demolition of his realm of responsibility. This is right. That angel declares, this is how bad sin in humanity is. The earth was made for man by God. Man is the pollution that the earth suffers. And notice what he says about God, who was and who is. We might be tempted to say, well, where's the who is to come? Uh, that one's not in this iteration of the doxology. Just who was and who is. Why is that? Probably indicating that God's very presence is imminent and his active, unending, ceaseless parade of judgments is present. There's no mistaking who's doing these things. And he says, you are the Holy One. God is sinless and perfect and, and therefore it's right for him to judge. And the angel says, because you judged these things. Praise to God because you're ruining the oceans. Praise to God because you're ruining all the fresh water. Praise to God because you're lowering the curtain on the theater of rebellious humanity. It's over. And God is praised for it by the angel. Verse 6 tells us one of the reasons why. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. And that closes with the short and stunning statement, they deserve it. Literally in the original, they are worthy. Normally that's a positive statement. Here it is, they are worthy of the judgment that is happening. The wages of sin is death. They are reaping what they have sown. The judgment fits the crime. You spilled the blood of innocence. God gives you blood to drink. Turn over to chapter 17 and look at verse 6. Speaking of Babylon portrayed as a woman, Babylon is the religious and political and economic world empire we'll get to in chapter 17. Portrayed as a woman in verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. God in this bold judgment is pouring out his wrath against her guilt. Look at verse 7, another response to this bold judgment. I heard the altar saying, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Here, the altar speaks. This is temple furniture talking. It is really remarkable here that the altar of incense, that is the, the altar of the gathered prayers of God's people, the prayers of the saints, they, they've gone into this altar of incense and they rise as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. What are the prayers? Come, Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How long, O Lord, when will you avenge our blood? Be vindicated, O God. Why do the nations rage? They're all the prayers of all the tensions of all the saints who have known, I love God and he's good and I'm not good and this world's a mess. God, when will you fix it? And the altar answers, now is the vindication of God. Now is the vindication of his people. Rescue from enemies, the solving of injustice, the end of persecution. Those prayers are now being answered. Genesis 18, 25, Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the earth do justly or rightly? And the altar says, yes, he will. Humanity has worshiped the creation. This is one of the fundamental flaws of the depravity of man. Although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They worshiped and served the created thing rather than the creator. And we see this all over the place, whether it's the worship of idols, whether it's the worship of self, whether it's the, the worship of the environment. Any exchange of God and his glorious being for created things is idolatry, blasphemous idolatry that will bring about the judgment of God. 
The tragedy of that kind of idolatry is it's no good for us to reject the true and living God is to reject life and love and joy and a living up to the purpose for which you've been created and to exchange it for stuff that will never satisfy for things that actually intend to kill you and ruin you for eternity. It's not a good trade. And yet that is the fundamental flaw of humanity in its rebellion. Forget God, all take stuff. Rebellious humanity has been the pollution on the earth. Designed by God to be a worshiper of God and a blessing to the earth, a steward of God's creation. But now the creator will tolerate it no longer. And creation itself will revolt against the humanity for which it was made. But listen to Romans 8 and Paul's testimony in verses 20 to 22. The creation was subjected to futility. Not able to live up for its, to its design. Not willingly, but because of God who subjected it in hope, a future hope. That the creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom, a specific kind of freedom, the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What does creation experience at the end of the great tribulation? Groaning, straining, looking forward to God's people looking like Jesus. When creation gets to be what it's supposed to be. During the great tribulation, creation's groans are the final labor pains, accelerating, agonizing, the creation undone. In fact, the language here sort of works backwards the creation language of the creation account in Genesis. It's all being undone because of human sin. The groaning of creation during the last portion of the Great Tribulation will be extreme. You might be asking, how will the remnant survive? I mean, there, there is to be a preserved remnant. We know how the story ends. We know what happens when Jesus re returns in Revelation 19. And there are saints whom he will protect from the surrounding armies. There are survivors who will be the sheep in the sheep and goats judgment of Matthew 25 who will survive into the millennial kingdom and repopulate a regenerated earth. How, how will they make it through this time? It's a, it's a good question. Where will they get food to eat? How, how will they live in an oxygen depleted environment? How will they go without water? Those are really good questions and I'm glad you asked and I don't know. <laughs> We do know that in the wilderness, God provided water for the Israelites in their wanderings out of a rock. He can do that. But we also know that the days will be cut short. That is cut down to three and a half years because it'll be so awful. Not even the elect could survive if God did not ordain the time frame. And then we also have Daniel chapter 12. And I'll just read you verses 11 and 12. This is the end of the book of Daniel. That's the Old Testament version of the book of Revelation in many senses. And he gives a time frame from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up. There will be 1290 days. That's an important number. Daniel is describing the time when Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, declares himself to be God, and demands universal worship. That is the, the start clock on the great tribulation, the last half of the tribulation period. And Daniel and Revelation give that time clock from that period forward as 1260 days, three and a half years, 42 months. Three different ways to say the same thing. And then he adds that time, times, and half a time. What does it deal with this 1290? What are the extra 30 days for? Well, well, we're not told. And then the next verse, Daniel says, how blessed is the one who keeps waiting and reaches the 1335 days. An extra 30 days to 1290 and then more days all the way up to 1335. What are these extra days for? The blessing in Daniel 1211 is the blessing of walking into the kingdom 
capital of Jerusalem, regenerated earth, a new garden of Eden all across the globe. We just read that what happens in these bold judgments brings about a scorched earth, coagulated blood for oceans, and everything dead. I believe those extra 30 days are the time period of judgment for any unbelieving survivors to stand before Jesus, Matthew 24, as he sits on the throne and separates them out as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And the sheep walk into the kingdom alive and the goats are sent to judgment, death. So the 30 days gives a time frame in which that can happen after Jesus' arrival. And then the 1,335 days gives an extra set of days for KP, cleanup, for whatever God's going to do to bring the coagulated red ball hanging in space back to a better glory than it ever had. So we don't, we don't know exactly how they will survive, how will they make it, except by God's grace and providence and personal care. That, that's a lesson for us. You're not going through that. I, whatever you're enduring right now, it's not that. And God is with his people. If he's with his people in the worst, he's with you now. There will be no human means of recovery to restore the earth to its former glory. I mean, what human technology is there to repopulate the oceans with marine life? But a supernatural regeneration of the planet in preparation for the kingdom, that's God's business. He'll do it. We're ahead of ourselves a little bit. That, was, that news was too good for this passage. I got, I got sidetracked. Let's get back to the bad news. Before we do that, one more thing, just gratitude to God. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have every reason to be grateful forever. If you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, it is appropriate for you to express gratitude to your maker that you're not under these bold judgments yet. It's appropriate. We're not yet past the point of no return in world history. Bowl number four, scorching sun. Verse eight, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has the authority over these plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory. The sun will be let loose by God to fry the earth. The ground will heat up. The atmosphere will seem to be on fire. The meteorolo meteorologists will be stunned there's no environmental technology that can control this weather. The Antichrist will not be able to protect himself or his followers. This global warming will be unstoppable. I was reading this week of a, of a commentator who is describing this coming global warming cataclysm. And he was comparing what the Bible says with what the scientific consensus says. And he was writing in 1935. And at the time, the scientific consensus said, and I quote, the sun is cooling off. <laughs> in those days, you didn't go to school and learn about global warming. Uh, you learn about global cooling. Uh, that was what was taught when I was in school, the, the new coming ice age. And the Bible wasn't untrue back then. It didn't matter what science said. What the Bible says is this is how the world ends. It's going to get a lot hotter. The sun around which our earth orbits is God's sun. It is his servant. It has consistently brought light and warmth and life to our world. God has been pleased to employ that star for human benefit. And we've taken it for granted. The earth, perfect distance from the sun for the sustaining of life. An atmosphere designed to protect earth's inhabitants. Those are not accidents of cosmic chance. This is a home designed by God for us and sustained by God all these millennia. And all of that power in the sun harnessed by God for our good will on that day be unleashed for harm. 
the sun will be deadly. Our world will be a house on fire. And notice the response in verse 9. They blasphemed the name of God. That is, they, they know who's doing this. This is God's business. They, they know his name and they curse him. They don't curse themselves. They know that the living God is responsible and they're pointing fingers at him. Even though the text says he has authority over these plagues. This is defiance. If you knew who was responsible for something, isn't it logical to say, please stop? That is not their appeal. They continue to judge God. They consider God to be in the wrong and they will not admit I am the problem. Notice the text says they did not repent. They did not do a 180 degree turn from their sins and their rebellious ways to meet God. Instead, their love of sin dominated. It manifests in a refusal to turn. They embraced the deception and they were sticking to it. And they didn't give him glory. Verse 9 says, they didn't acknowledge the one true God and respond appropriately with reverence, worship, surrender, and repentance. Listen, how bad is the human heart? How illogical in its slavery to sin? How insane without the intervention of the love of God? To endure the physical and psychological torments of the tribulation period, to so clearly see the end of the earth coming, to have everything you love stripped away, and still to hold on to pride and sin and rebellion. That these judgments, clearly from God, who has authority over them, do not evoke a change of heart, that is a testimony to the wickedness of the human heart, the illogic of our depravity. The human heart left to itself will not love God. That's how bad we are. You may have heard the protest. You know, I would believe in God if he would just prove himself. If he would come down here and say something. <laughs> really? You would? God will prove himself and the world will not believe and it will be too late. Unrepentant humanity will have run past the point of no return. They will have crossed the Rubicon of rebellion. Bowl five. Miserable darkness. Look down at verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. This is lights out on the earth. As the ninth plague in Egypt, Exodus 10 we read in Exodus 10, 21, then Yahweh said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. Can you imagine a, a darkness so thick that it's tangible? This fifth bowl judgment will be global, not merely Egyptian. I don't know if this bowl judgment is discriminating. The, the sores were discriminating. They only went out on those who had the mark of the beast. Uh, will the darkness be discriminating too? Will there be pockets of remnant who enjoy light? I don't know. In the pri prior judgment, the sun set the earth ablaze and now the lights go out. And can you imagine what that does to the mind? To the scientists, to the astronomers, to, to all the logic, to the people who have taken for granted the stability of the way that our solar system works. Nothing's reliable anymore. And when you get to the seventh bowl judgment, the earth will be not reliable. It will shake so hard, all the cities of the earth will crumble. What does that do to the mind? And this darkness is unnerving. It encompasses the kingdom of the beast, that is, the whole earth whose capital is in the rebuilt city of Babylon. The prophets Joel, Zephaniah, Nahum, Isaiah, they all spoke of this calamity. And in addition to the darkness, humanity will suffer the ongoing results of the previous plagues that continue. I look down at verse 10 in the second half. They gnawed their tongues because of pain still experiencing the, the pain of those malignant sores. 
Verse 11 says, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. They will be living in tangible darkness in awful, unrelievable pain, physical agony, with a hopeless future. Uh, There are no oceans left. There is no fresh water to be found. There is death all around and the awful stench of coagulated blood everywhere. Economies are in shambles. The curtain is drawing down on the earth dwellers. And they did not tame their tongues of blasphemy against God. And so they will gnaw their tongues in agony under his judgment. And when these bold judgments are dumped out, humanity and the home made for humanity will be past the point of no return. Notice again the response, verse 11. They did not repent of their deeds. They just sinned more. This gives us a hint at a question people ask sometimes. Won't there be repentance in hell? I mean, the eternal lake of fire, that's a long time. Conscious eternal torment under the wrath of God. Won't somebody somewhere say, I'm sorry? (laughs) Could they be sprung? That's not how it works. That's not how the human heart works. Punitive justice does not change the heart. Only grace changes the heart. Right now is the age of grace. Believe the gospel because in the next age, in the next life, no grace, no repentance, no I'm sorry's, only the gnashing the teeth and the gnawing of the tongues in continued, unrepentant, blasphemous rebellion. There's no repentance in hell. Hell is not remedial. It is just justice. It's awful. The sin remains forever. And God's justice against that sin must remain forever as well. If you're here this morning, you're not hearing a fairy tale. If you have not surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are resisting surrender to the one who has authority over these plagues. You are resisting surrender to the one who will sit on his glorious throne and judge every thought you've ever had, every motive you've ever entertained, every word and every deed you've ever committed. He's your maker and your judge. You will stand before him one day. And if you go and stand before him, And all you have in your hands is your own achievements. Whatever you think might be good or bad. None of them meet the righteous standards of God's holy perfection. And you are liable forever for them. If, however, in this era of grace, you turn to your maker and turn to your judge in faith and repentance and surrender... You find a savior who 2,000 years ago came to earth in person and died on a cross, hanging in midair, executed by humans, but crushed by the infinite weight of his holy father to actually pay for your sins. He was a substitute in the place of every sinner who would believe. And before it's too late, let me appeal to you. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from the wrath that is coming. Bowl number six. Armageddon preparation. Verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates. Its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. The Sixth bowl judgment doesn't bring a new calamity on humanity. It just opens up a path. The path is the opening of the way for armies to participate in the battle of Armageddon. I have a map for you. Maps are fun. This map depicts the most unfun period of human history. Uh, what you have there in the in the middle is is my dots. I don't know where my dots are. Um, how do I explain this? 
Uh, Europe is above the map. The East, uh, East Asia is above and to the right. Africa is down and to the left. You have the Persian Gulf, is the body of water into the Red Sea on the bottom right. Mediterranean Sea on the left, Red Sea down the middle. From the brown spot up top, Turkey and Armenia, you, you have the mountains from which flows the Euphrates River all the way down into the Persian Gulf. That area is greenish. It's green on purpose. That's part of the Fertile Crescent, the Tigris and Euphrates River coming down from snowy mountains down to the Persian Gulf uh, have fed agriculture there uh, for as long as the world has spun. And the Euphrates River historically has been a barrier of empires. It was the eastern barrier of the Roman Empire. It was also the eastern barrier of the promised land promised to Abraham. We think of Israel as the the little New Jersey-sized sliver in purple over by the Mediterranean Sea. But the property extends technically all the way out to the Euphrates River, uh, the bottom edge of that green that you see on the map. That you be to the west of the Euphrates River is a vast wilderness desert that all by itself is prohibitive to army advances. And the Euphrates River, 1,800 miles long, navigable from the Persian Gulf for some 1,200 of those miles, 10 to 30 feet deep, sometimes 1,200 yards across, was not crossable by armies. And so it was a natural barrier to warfare. If, if you wanted to cross paths with Africa, Asia, and Europe coming from the east, you couldn't get there unless you went over and around the Euphrates River, which is why when Babylon, who invaded Israel, which is down closer to the Persian Gulf, it was said to be a country from the north, even though they're almost due east because they came from the north to get around the Euphrates River. The sixth bowl judgment of God on the earth is the drying up of the Euphrates River supernaturally as a judgment against humanity. And it will seem like an open pathway for all the armies, the vast armies of the east to join all the other armies in Antichrist and Satan's war against the feeble band of saints assembled in Jerusalem and against Jesus Christ himself. Jesus will come down as we've studied already to the Mount of Olives, enter the city of Jerusalem, be there with the 144,000 and the remnant survivors and protect them from the encroaching armies. The drying up the Euphrates river opens up a pathway for the Eastern armies to join the other armies pouring into the Valley of decision, the Valley of Jehoshaphat for the battle of Armageddon. That will lead us to the seventh bowl beginning in verse 17 of chapter 16, Lord willing next week. This is a narrative portion of our Bible. It, it tells us history Much of our Bible is narrative. It tells us what happened. This section is narrative. It just tells us what will happen. It is history of the future. And we need to ask the question, what do I do with these narrative portions of the Bible? Noah built a box and eight people got inside and two of each kind of animal got inside and they floated on the floodwaters. Go therefore and do likewise. No, that's... (laughs) That's not what we do with a narrative portion of scripture. But it is helpful for us to cross the bridge, as it were, over time and history and language and culture and go sit with Noah in the box on the floodwaters, sit in his shoes, understand it, feel it, smell it in our imaginations, get there and be there. That text isn't about me but it has something to do with me. And since much of our Bible is narrative, you need to be in the habit as you're reading your Bible, not uh, what does this passage have to do with me? Because uh, that is me like putting yourself in the text. 
But what does this text have to do with me in the sense of that was my God and he did those things? In what ways does that indict my heart? In what ways does that shake up my loyalties, my affections, my loves? Are there things I need to repent of? Do I need to think of God differently? Do I need to embrace the glory of God in judgment? Say in the story of Noah, where only eight people out of the entire mass of humanity survived. Sometimes we think of Noah as a story of salvation, and it was. But just as much, it is a story of the glory of God in judgment. Think about another narrative. Seven bold judgments poured out in a climactic series of God's wrath against earth dwellers. I'm not planning to be there. If you're in Christ, you won't be there. If it happens in your lifetime and you're not in Christ, you might be there. We don't know when it's going to go down. But no matter where you are on that spectrum of applicability, this passage has something to do with you. Do you feel it already? You might be thinking up some ways that this applies to your own life. Perhaps you'll talk about it at lunch. I need to share the gospel more while people are not past the point of no return. My neighbors haven't crossed the Rubicon yet. (laughs) They need the gospel. Maybe you're thinking forward about that world empire called Babylon, the religious, political, economic system. Maybe you're tangled up already. There's a plea in, in Revelation 17, come out from her, my people. Do you feel indicted about worldliness? It's all going up in flames. Listen, it's appropriate for us to love the ocean. I love the ocean. It's appropriate for us to love the mountains and greenery and freshwater springs, a cool mountain spring on a hot day. Those things are good. They are good provisions of God for which we ought to express gratitude. But do you love them inordinately? A worshiper of the created thing rather than the creator? Are you infatuated with external beauty and the pursuit of youth and vitality over and against growing old in the grace of God and being holy? There are perhaps as many ways to apply a text like this as there are believers in the room. Talk about it at lunch. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. It is so clarifying. And we should read it more often. And we should read it better. And we should talk about it more. We need to be changed by your word. We need it to be flowing through us. We need to be meditating on it, memorizing it, speaking it, singing it. Lord, we want your mind and your heart. We want to think the way you think. And we are so easily distracted living in this world, forgetting that it is soon doomed. That it is running rapidly in its rebellion toward its own destruction. Let us be in it, but not of it. For your glory and for the sake of the great commission, while there is still time, let us be preachers of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.